All right, let's do this. Hello, everyone. I, I, I'm probably going to take up close to the hour and a half we have scheduled. And this may be a little less, so please, uh, at any time, stop and, and ask questions. This talk, I wrote this with Oracle Corporation. This is, uh, this, this is a talk I gave at Java One last year. Um, a, a lot of the research and pointers were given to me by Sean Mullen, who's the head of, of Oracle security team. I don't work for Oracle. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a foo. I'm a friend of Oracle, right? I don't work for them or consult for them, but they often promote my work and I, and I try to promote theirs where I think it's fair. So, and I'm, I agree with the, these are good things to point out. This is not meant to be a controversial talk. We're just going to review some of the new enhancements to Java that are here already and are coming down the pipe from a security point of view. Most of this is cryptography based. And if you haven't seen Bart's talk, go, go leave and go see it now. Hello, my name is Jim. I'm going to be your you know, uh, speaker for today. One of the reasons I'm affiliate with Oracle is I worked with Oracle to write a book, Ironclad Java Building Secure Web Applications. This is, uh, this is, this may, uh, any, uh, if you look at like the child laborers in Bangladesh who do clothing worth in factories. Hello, sir. If you look at, if you go to, if you go to, if you, if you go to, can I borrow a second? If you go to uh, Bangladesh um, and look at child labor workers, I got paid, they got paid more than I did to write this book, right? Cool. Thank you, sir. Uh, I need, actually, what, what's your name? Bernard. What's your, Bernard, pardon? Bernard, um, go forth <laughs> and write secure code Bernard. There we go. Thank you so much. He asked me to do that before. So. All right. And, and, like, you know, this, this is not really working for Oracle. It's slave labor for Oracle. Like, this is like, uh, I, I, it was like 55 cents an hour I was paid to write this book, right? I got my recent royalties, royalties check. And I gave it, I'm like, honey, I got my royalties check for the, for the quarter. It's like $30 or something, right? You know, can't even buy a good meal in Belgium with that, right? So, okay. Let's, let, let's, get, let's get to work, though. So, before we get into the, the different controls I wanted, uh, the different controls available, let's talk about what the Java enhancement proposal process. Let's talk about the, the, the area in Java where if you see a security deficiency in Java, how you can do something about it. Java is loosely, it's not open source, it's an, it's, it, it, it does encourage community involvement in, in extending the language, and it's called the JEP process, the Java Enhancement Proposal Process, where you can propose some kind of enhancement to Java. Along this, I, I, just, just to, to, to amuse you as well, I'm gonna throw a few Hawaiian words in here, right? So this is a Hawaiian word, ohana, very common Hawaiian word. It means family, right? It's, it usually refers to the whole family. It's usually referring to not you and your family. It refers to the whole community. So I'll, I'll mention the Java ohana a few times, and I'm talking about the, the various folks involved in, in Java, right? That, that goes from different academic researchers to the core developers of Java to community members who've submitted JEP, uh, you know, to Oracle, who's one of the curators of the Java language, to the... 2 million developers who use the Java language. So when we talk about the Java family or Java Ohana, it involves a lot of folks. And this is controversial. Not everyone has liked what Oracle has done as the steward. So I'm not gonna talk about the politics if Oracle is good or bad for Java. I'm gonna talk about the reality of where we are today and how you can participate in the, the whole JEP process. So again, JEP stands for the Java Enhancement Proposal. This is how you drive change in the Java ecosystem. And this is a huge amount of work. This is non-trivial. If you ever looked at the code in, that runs JVM or JDK, this is mammoth, like writing an operating system. This is mammothly complex and difficult code. So to really submit a, a, a JEP that, that's rigorous and helpful is a extreme amount of work. But a lot of folks in the Java community, they like to complain about how bad Java is. It's bad for this reason, bad for that reason. And, and, and my opinion is that the complaint is not as useful as the participation. So if you really think that there's something wrong in Java, then, then do something, right? Uh, 
uh, attention, you know, uh, uh, the attention from the core Java team and the core Java security team is going to be given to those who put the work in, right? And so my, like, I've been complaining that Java does not have an escaping library, a good, rigorous escaping library for cross-site scripting. And so I worked with the team to build one for, for, uh, the, or for uh, the OWASP Foundation. Jeff Ikonowski is the main developer. Dr. Jeff Ikonowski is the main developer of that library. My personal mission for 2017 is to submit a JEP for, with that encoder API that can be used in JEE to help Java web developers do proper escaping for cross-site scripting defense. So again, the complaint is valid, I think, but it's not very helpful to the world. And we want to be helpful to the world, right? We don't. We want to make sure that the, the, the work that we do has the broadest positive impact. So JEP it up. That's my own personal challenge and mission for 2017. And so, there's a formal process established. It's not that bad. But here are two gentlemen from academia who have gone through this process. This is Mike Ernst and, and Werner Dietl. They, these, are the, these are the gentlemen that built type annotations, which we'll talk about in just a bit, which have dramatic benefits in a lot of different areas, right? <coughs> so please, you know, I, I have no problem with complaint. Complain. Point out what's wrong. But take the next step and, and do something about it. When you do that, the benefits are, are multi-tiered, right? You're going to benefit the whole Java community. You'll benefit the Java development team. You'll benefit everyone who uses the language. You'll, you'll benefit yourself. This is a When you have pushed through the JET process and you've got something in and it's added to the core of Java language, that's a real big feather in your cap as a professional. That's something you stick on your resume, right? And it's painful. It's not easy. It's political. It's technical. It's writing. It's, it's complex. But the benefits to you as well are dramatic. So please, get involved. It's, it's, it's uh, very often we as developers get hidden in our own code corner. And I want to encourage you in your career to, to get out there. So let's look at some of the Java 9 security gems. We'll look at Java 8 and Java 9. Let's start with some of the, the upcoming enhancements that we'll see in Java. And please, if you have any comments or, or you want to participate, stop me at any time if you want to jump in here. I have about an hour talk, so we have about a half an hour of additional talk that I, I'd like to add, so please dive in at any time. And complaints are okay too, right? Like I I'm going to mention that we're at, uh, uh, you know, JEP 249, we'll talk about OCSP stapling. I'll use this as, a, as an excuse to talk about what OCSP stapling is. One complaint I got from Yo, which is a fair complaint, is this is not there yet. This is not going to show up till Java 9. So I'm going to celebrate it in this talk. But Yo, you are right. When should OCSP stapling been part of the Java language? Like what, three or four years ago at, at least. But these, this is a slow, it's slow and bureaucratic to get these things in. So it's not even live yet. We're not even going to see it till Java 9. And Java 9's been delayed for almost a year now. So Java, Java 9's being delayed because certain moves they're making in Java 9, the modularity pieces, which we'll look at, are so, it's so difficult, way more difficult than anyone expected. It's delaying Java 9. And the team made the choice where they want to get this right. Being able to modularize Java is critical for a lot of reasons, which we'll look at in just a bit. Other enhancements we see in Java 9 is going to be DTLS. This is a, a non-TLS uh, data transport mechanism, which we see a lot in gaming. Straight up why, why it's such an important protocol. Um, we'll also look at TLS application layer, the protocol negotiation extension for those who are deploying multiple sites on one server. We'll look at that in just a bit as well. We have the initial SHA-3 implementation coming out in Java 9. And, and, we're, and, and 288 is debatable, right? When I wrote this presentation for Java 1, SHA-1 certificates are getting fully disabled. But they're bringing it back in a little bit for, for checking the integrity of, 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 down, of applications you're running because it's too much is going to break if they just fully disable SHA-1. And I've critiqued the team on this, but Sean Mullen, the, the, the head of Java security, is like, so 
what's going to happen, Jim, if we really shut this down, the number of Java applications, a lot of the web, a lot of the, the web start and technologies to run Java applets remotely, it's all based on the signature, you know, integrity signatures from software authors. And there's so much uh, of the, pre the, the, there are so many existing applications that depend upon SHA-1 certificates. If they just fully shut it down for Java 9, they're going to break all, everything. It's going to be a, a, a lot more than people expect it's going to break. I actually want to break some eggs. My choice would be, and again, you know, we've had this talk. I always take the extreme security position. Enough people take the other position. So I, I'd rather break Java and lock it down and, and force uh, other things to, to bring it back or force developers to go and re, to go and re-sign their, application, their applications. But, you know, that, that's idealistic. And what the team decided to do is not to do that. We'll get to that later as well. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you may have to risk that the stuff like that just gets disabled and then there's no checking at all. So yeah, that, that might be the point, the point of view from the other side then. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I, uh, I spoke to, with, with Mark Reynolds on, on DevOps and yeah, the weight on their shoulders is quite heavy of course because I'm dependent on their work but so is 200 and, uh, or 2 million others uh, uh, literally. As but they make an interesting mistake with security, or they make an interesting mistake with the compiler, yeah, stuff will break a lot of the dependence. As the ancient one said to Doctor Strange in the movie, and this is a lesson I'm working on myself, what did she say to him? She said, it's not about you. <laughs> right? So, this is a lesson I have to learn myself as well. I sometimes forget this. It's not about you, dude. It's not about me. It's about the two million developers who are using Java. Yeah. So there's a much, you gotta look at that. Imagine being Sean Mullen, right? He's a contractor for Oracle that leads the Oracle security team. Otherwise known as the worst job in the world, in my opinion. So the number, the number of concerns he has to balance between the user community, the development community, the web use community, which is kind of, which is, which is problematic. His employer, Oracle, and their business drivers, the, the different concerns that he has to hold on his shoulders at one time is, is dramatic and in conflict most of the time. So I don't want that job, neither do you. But this is why they chose to, to kind of weaken um, JEP 288, which again, we'll look at in just a moment. Okay, so another Hawaiian word to amuse, Akamai. You've heard that from the, uh, the CDN, but the Akamai is just a Hawaiian word that means smart or clever, right? It's not always a positive thing, not always, right? Sometimes smart or clever is, is, not, is something you don't trust, but I, I, dig I digress. So we're going to look at a couple clever things, I hope, here. So JEP219, first of all. Let's look at datagram transport layer security. So TLS is the main transport security protocol that drives the web today. We get three major cryptographic benefits from these transport security protocols. We get confidentiality. The spy can't look at your data. We get integrity. The spy can't modify your data without detecting it. And we get uh, authenticity. The, the server we're visiting is the correct server. And loosely, those are some of the benefits of TLS. But there are certain situations where TLS is, just, is not, is not going to work. And let's, let's get into that. I'm going to read some of my notes. Please forgive me for reading off the notes, but this is heady stuff. So what's the motivation here? It's important to support DTLS, data, transport, layer security, to satisfy secure transport requirements for an increasing number of datagram compatible applications. You want to take a look at RFC 4347. Who here reads RFCs? Anyone here read, read an RFC? I am proud of this room. This is important. When I stop and run into an RFC, I go and read it. How many times does it take you to read an RFC to understand it? Most RFC authors compete with who can write the most unreadable RFC, right? This is part of white papers and academia in general, but it usually takes a couple reads to figure this out. The most intelligent person in the world in history in terms of IQ is a woman named Marie von Sfant. And, she, and I, I, I'm, she spoke about how she got that level of brilliant. She's like, you know, it's not like I'm not, it's work, right? I read stuff three times. So I highly recommend when you run into an RFC, take the couple hours and go read it. It's going to fill your brain as a developer with a technical knowledge that is going to 
pop out when you least expect it. So go read the RFC. So RFC 4347, it lists a number of reasons where TLS is no longer sufficient for these type of applications. So TLS is the most widely deployed protocol for securing network traffic, but TLS must run over a reliable transport channel, which is typically TCP. It therefore cannot be used to secure unreliable datagram traffic. That's a quote from the RFC. There's another quote from the RFC. An increasing number of application layer protocols have been designed that use UDP transport. In particular, protocols like SIP, the Session Initiation Protocol, and popular gaming protocols are increasingly popular. And don't, you know, gaming is not a small thing. This is a 50 to 100 billion dollar industry across the world. This is beginning to eclipse traditional forms of entertainment. So this is a big sector of, of the technical economy. So I know it's just a game, but to be able to support these in secure ways is, is, is critical. So and, and another, another quote from the RFC. In many cases, the most desirable way to secure client server apps is to use TLS. However, the requirement for datagram semantics automatically prohibits TLS. Thus, we need a datagram compatible variant of TLS to solve these, these use cases. So the protocols that support DTLS but are not limited to, it's going to include RFC 5238. That's DTLS over datagram congestion control protocol. There's RFC 6083, datagram transport layer security for stream control transmission protocol. RFC 5764, DTLS the extension to establish keys for the secure real-time transport protocol and RFC 7252, constrained application protocol. And if you look at something like OAuth, you know, we have the same, uh, the same family of, of RFCs to extend OAuth as well for, for, key, for key management and other needs. This is a sign of usually a, a, mature, a mature RFC when a family pops up around it. We usually need more than one. Last note, Google Chrome and Firefox now support DTLS SRTP, right? They, they support the extension to establish keys for secure real-time transport protocol. Version 1 and 2 are also supported by the major TLS vendors and implementations including OpenSSL, new TLS, and Microsoft S Channel support DTLS as well. So boom, we got this in Java. We finally have this coming, uh, showing up in Java 9 because of JEP 219. This is something the core security team worked on. Building a new transport protocol is extreme challenge. Be careful about using some of the early rollouts of this. I like to wait for a few. Uh, I, I, I don't like to bleed that much. I'd rather let someone else bleed. So let, uh, let's, let, let's, let's, wait, let's wait a version or two before we start depending on this. The first rollout's not always the best. Let's just move on. Jep. Somebody, somebody has to. <laughs> What's that? Somebody has to, has to do the bleeding, right? The bleeding edge, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll let other companies do that. And when it stabilizes, that's usually when we want to use it. But I, I give the, the Java team some credit. The, the, the rigor that they do in their quality testing is pretty decent. They have a very similar set of problems as Flash does. A lot of people attack Flash because of all their security problems. But what is Flash? Flash is basically an operating system that needs to run on every single piece of hardware on the planet, even to this day. The security challenge there is dramatic. Java is write once, run everywhere, or more like write once, debug everywhere. So, eh, sorry about that. So we have the same kind of widespread deployment of Java that makes getting these things right incredibly challenging. These are difficult engineering issues, right? Let's look at JEP 244. This is the TLS application layer protocol negotiation extension jep 244 so why what's the motivation for this right in order to support tls clients and servers that wish to use multiple application layer protocols over over the same transport layer port the alpn extension allows clients to provide a list of application layer protocols it supports uh, in order of preference. A server can then select one of the advertised client protocols and tell the client which protocol will be used in the TLS connection. So, yeah, when different protocols are supported on the same TCP or UDP port, um, Alpin allows a negotiation to determine which protocol will be used 
in that particular connection. This is, uh, uh, this is consumed by JEP 110, which is the HTTP2 client. No big deal, it's gonna show up in Java though. Java 9 is where this is gonna arrive. Again, it's not out yet, it's something that will be, will be ready very soon, any day now. So, JEP 249. And by the way, the delay of Java 9 freak is freaking a lot of people out. This, this, is, this, is now, this is now not just late, this is very late. But I am impressed with the commitment to quality going on here. And we'll look at why it's late in just a moment. So JEP 249, and we're gonna use JEP 249 as an excuse to dig deep into what stapling is here. This is gonna be a barrel of monkeys. So JEP 249 introduces OCSP stapling for TLS. What is OCSP stapling all about? What, what am I, which topic around TLS am I gonna talk about when we talk about OCSP stapling? Why is this important? It's all about revocation, exactly. So, what's OCSP? Um, online certificate status protocol. Online certificate status protocol, correct? Okay, gotcha. I just say OCSP, sorry about yeah. that. Hey, go Google it. Go Google, go, 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 Google, right? Go Google. All right, so JEP 249 can implement OCSP stapling for TLS clients. and. Let, 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 let's talk about why this is happening, right? It usually takes like 10 days for revocation information to propagate. That's not good. Browsers have horrific soft fail policy with other forms of, of revocation that makes revocation easily attackable or just completely ineffective. OCSP requests can be intercepted in trivial fashions when we look at old school OCSP before stapling arrived which will let me intercept and block a, a certain revocation check. And then the browsers often, if the browsers get blocked, they ignore it and move on. They're not gonna use that moment to actually stop the TLS connection from happening. So browsers are wimpy about this topic. And again, most browsers fully ignore revocation completely unless it's an EV cert. So we have multiple la layers of problems here. Let me read my notes as well for you. So what's the motivation? Why are we, why are we shifting from OCSP or old school uh, revocation lists to stapling? So what's the motivation? Checking the revocation status of a TLS certificate, an X509 certificate, it's a critical part of valid certificate-based authentication. However, certificate status checking using OCSP typically involves a network request for each certificate being checked from the browser to the, uh, to the OCSP responder. So because of the additional network request, enabling OCSP checking for TLS on the client side can have significant impact on performance that's also relatively weak from a security point of view. So OCSP stapling allows the presenter of a certificate rather than the issuing certificate authority to bear the resource cost of providing OCSP responses. In a TLS context, it's the responsibility of the TLS server to request the OCSP response and send it to the clients during the handshake. This also allows the server to cache the OCSP responses and supply them to all clients that are connecting to it. A dramatic performance enhancement over old school OCSP. So, let, let, let's look at this now. So this is, now this is not stapling. This is online certificate status protocol pre-stapling. And this is an alternative to CRLs. Now, first of all, online certificate status protocols created as an alternative to certificate revocation lists. The answer, the question is why? So, okay, we have three steps we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at CRLs. We're gonna look at, we're gonna talk about CRLs and explain what it is in a moment. We'll look at OCSP in this slide, then we'll look at stapling, OCSP stapling, which is where we wanna be, which is what we just got in Java 9. So if we go back to CRLs, this is the old school certificate revocation list. This uses significant bandwidth. According to GoDaddy, their certificate revocation list file grew from 158K in 2007 to 41 megabytes in 2013. Now there's ways to optimize this. I'm kind of pushing the point, but the, the, the gist is when we went to the beginning of the web to do revocation, they would carry around a list of all certs that are revocated. 
and that's just that doesn't scale. It's a, you you don't you don't want to start moving a 40 megabyte file around to all clients. It's just not going to work. But when an SSL client encounters a cert that contains OCSP information, it's going to okay. I'm sorry. So let, let, let's look at this here. So what's OCSP? So I go talk to the server. I want to make a TLS connection. Boom. We do a certificate verification step all as well. Then if the certificate says to do so, the client is going to make a is going to make a request right to the OCSP responder over which protocol over HTTP. What's wrong with that? So now the client is going to make it's, it's, it's in the middle of doing a TLS handshake. It wants to check if that TLS certificate it just got is revoked or not. So it goes and makes an HTTP connection to some OCSP responder, even if you're the one who controls that, to check if it's revoked or not. Someone tell me what's wrong with this picture, other than privacy. Remember, I'm an American. I don't care about privacy, right? So other than privacy, what's wrong with this picture? In, authenticity in what way? You're right. There's no authenticity to get to the responder. It's that uh, you hope it's the right responder, right? It's hope-based security. I like, ho I like hope, it's a good idea, but it's usually not very good in science, right? It doesn't really fit in science. What else is wrong with this picture? Yeah, it's, it, it's an integrity issue, I think. You never know if the response that comes back is actually the response that was sent. What else is wrong? That, that's also a big thing. If you don't care about security, it is a dramatic performance problem as well. So when an SSL client or TLS client encounters a cert that contains OCSP information, it contacts a designated OCSP server to determine if the cert's been revoked or not. The key that signs a response does not need to be the same key that signed the certificate. Go ahead, Yo. Yes. I will talk about that in the next slide. So you're, you're, so we, we've identified in just a matter of like two minutes a series of different problems. Privacy leakage to the responder, um, integrity issues, uh, authenticity issues, denial of service issues, and performance issues in under two minutes. So we all agree the problems here are pretty dramatic. Let's get to what Yo was talking about. Let's look at some attacks against OCSP. So OCSP used to include a nonce, but this didn't scale well when caching and CDM became the norm. So as a result, clients don't send the nonce, and if they, send, if they do send it, servers ignore them. So I, let, let me rewind. Here's, here's, the, here's the attack. Here's the attack, right? The app talks to the server. Boom. We now want to go out to the OCSP responder to check if it's, if it's been revoked or not. And I can just man... It's HTTP. So how difficult is it for me to man the middle HTTP? It's trivial, right? Open source tools to do this. Now I can, I can man the middle, I can tell, just tell the client everything is good, and we're done. So that's one attack, that's one attack. I just man the middle, tell the client everything is good, and we're done. It's not, not, it's not, not, even, not even that difficult. And, and let, me, let me take a step back. I can't just say it's good. I need to provide a, a digital signature base check to say it's good. So what we can do is we can do a replay attack. I can, as an attacker, I can record over HTTP a previous handshake and previous response from the, from the OCSP responder that says everything is good with proper signatures. And then I can man the middle of that, replay that acceptable response, and I've, I just got past it and I'm done. Not, it's not that difficult to pull this off. This is a basic cryptographic replay attack. But what Yo was talking about is this attack, right? Where, I, again, I go to the web server, I get my certificate. Let me, let me go back. Let me let it play. Play it out. Hello. Let me see. Attacks against this. Yeah. Sorry. There it is. 
Ooh, it's so exciting. Right, the other thing I can do is that, that's the OCSP request. And what did the man in the middle do? It just caught it and dropped it. It didn't even reply, didn't even worry about it, just caught it and dropped it. So here's the question. What does the browser do when it makes an OCSP HTTP request to a responder and the responder is either down from a denial of service attack or it just doesn't respond for some reason? What does the browser do? It fails, it fails insecurely and lets it ride. So just by, just by uh, intercepting and swallowing the, the OCSP request, you're, you've gotten past it. So as we can see, there, there are relatively, relatively trivial ways for a network attacker to get around old school OCSP. This is why stapling came about. And this is what stapling is, to overcome performance, privacy, and multiple security issues, OCSP was created. The web server is gonna be the one to talk to the CA and obtain a fresh response. The server can then cache the OCSP info and submit it to the client attached to the search. Besides privacy, this has a dramatic uh, Im improvement on performance and resolves the man in the middle drop package attack that we see with OCSP. And we saw this in Apache as of 2.4 and above has supported this. So this is something that's been around for, for a bit, right? This is not a, a new technology. So again, so I make a request to the web server, standard exchange, and I'm now making a request from the web server to the responder. I get the response, add the acceptable response to my cert, cache it, and then deliver that to all of my users. So with that, and now the user is, 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 is not gonna have to go back to the responder at all. That acceptable OCSP stapling information is attached the browser verifies through standard signature verification and we're done. So this is the way to roll. We're gonna see this in Java 9. Just can't you feel the excitement in the air right now? Are you with me? Are you with me? Awesome. Why are you not at Bart's talk? Let, never mind, never mind. All right, so JEP 287, let, let, let's carry on here. JEP 287, any question about stapling? Pretty straightforward, everyone. Did, did I explain stapling in a way that satisfies your PhD brilliance in mind? <laughs> Sorry. How, how does the browser or the app enforce the fact that stapling should be present? I'm sorry? How is it enforced that stapling should be present? I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I believe it's, it's subtly different per browser. If it's an EV certificate, it's going to force it. It's very similar to the, to the um, signature check that we see in normal TLS. It's just another signature check from the responder that's attached to your cert from your web server. So and it's, it's about browser support. And usually, I, I'm, I don't have the, the exact details. It's just off the top of my head. It's, it's usually only going to be enforced if it's EV. If it's not, they usually don't even do the check, right? For browser specifically, you have a must staple header. So you can actually tell the browser the header that staple should be enforced for the web Is it TLS response header? Or? No, it's a HTTP response header. What else? Keep, keep going. This is good. You know, this is, these are good questions. I, I don't know that level of depth. I'd have to dig into it a bit. But this is stuff that's been around. We, we, this easy, easy way to figure it out. Let's, let's chat about it after this, and I'll be, I'll be happy to dig into it with you. But I believe it's a browser support issue, and I also believe it's an EV-specific issue. If you're not doing EVE, at least browsers a year ago, they wouldn't even do a revocation check. They'd, even if you specified to do it, they would ignore it if it's not EV, I believe. And I'll, I'll get back, I'll, I'll, ch I'll check into it and drop you a note. So it's, it's easy to figure this out. I think, isn't it the same as with the, in general, validating your certificate you're trying to implement it? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I was probably yeah. 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 I'm not too sure. That's why I was asking. For browsers, I don't know if they should maybe use a must staple header to specify that it should be done. But I'm not sure how to find more browsers. And I thought must staple was a, was a, a was a TLS configuration as part of your as part of your TLS server side configuration? I didn't realize it was just a basic response header. So it, this is some, I, I, I'm making guesses now. I need to look into this. I'll get I'll get I'll send you a little a little a little note once I once I finish looking that up. It's it's pretty straightforward stuff. Let's let's, let's shift gears though. Let, let's shift gears to Jep 287 next. And if you're Phil, uh, Philip, are you looking it up now or? Yeah, w w interrupt me when, when, you have, when you have an answer for us. I'd love to let people know about this. 
Let, let's shift gears and look at JEP 287, the initial SHA-3 implementation. When you start adding a new cryptographic primitive to a language, especially one that is not even like done yet, right? This is still an evolving standard. SHA-1 is not a complete standard. I'm going to talk about some non-goals as well as the motivation to why this is being done, right? So JEP-287, this is not going to implement the Shake 128 and Shake 256 extendable output functions because they're not approved as hash functions yet. The latest PKCS 11 uh, version 2.4 draft does not contain SHA-3 support. Thus, there's no change to the Sun PKCS 11 provider. Also, this JEP is not implementing SHA-3 based algorithms for other cryptographic functions yet, like signatures, MACs, and ciphers, since there's no standards for them yet. Those are gonna be covered in subsequent JEPs. What is being done though, what the motivation here is that SHA-2 was published about 10 years ago. And although no significant attacks on SHA-2 have been demonstrated, NIST perceived the need for a dissimilar cryptographic hash function as an alternative to SHA-2. This has been nine years in the making. SHA-3 is the first cryptographic hash NIST uh, uh, algorithm that NIST developed using a public competition and vetting process like we saw when AES was chosen as, as one of the US standards. So FIPS 202, SHA-3 standard, permutation-based hash and extendable output function was finalized as a, as a standard, the initial part of the standard in August of 2015. There's additional standards needed to roll them into signatures and roll them into Macs and so forth. Cryptographic vendors such as Bouncy Castle, they started supporting SHA-3 when FIPS 202 was still the draft. Solaris also supports SHA-3 in, in the Solaris 12 release. And since hash functions are used extensively in security applications all over the place, and SHA-3 implementations are already being added by other vendors, it's critical that Java at least has the initial rollout of SHA-3, and that's what we have here. And there's no new APIs necessary. This is part of the this is just part of the, the cryptographic provider mechanism inherent in Java. I, I, whenever I'm doing crypto in Java, I'm always going to use Bouncy Castle though to make sure I have the, the strongest series of algorithms available. So usually you want to do this through Bouncy in my experience. Let's look at JEP 288 next. Philip, what do you got for us on stapling? Do you get an answer to that? Uh, sorry, you make the request to the server. The server is gonna is gonna respond with the public key of that server signed, plus another chunk of data around stapling signed as well by the responder. Correct? No, so in, in the certificate, there is also a flag. That yeah, there, the most stapler is a flag in the certificate. Right, it's not a response header; it's a TLS certificate flag. Yeah. So, it, so but, but today, stapling works. It's, it's, it's available. I believe it's for EV only, and it's a, it's a configuration flag on your actual TLS certificate as you set your, your TLS config up. Right? Yes, for now it is. Bing, How bingo. Java handle What's that? How would Java handle that then? I mean, is it by default? Java oh, no, I'm, I'm just saying the core primitive to support stapling are now in Java. So this is where it comes into play, right? You're, you're, it comes into play in two places. You're doing a, you're doing a, uh, uh, a Java client that needs to be, and then you're doing TLS to a server. The server brings you back stapling information. Your client needs to understand that to do the check. So it's client side. But also, if you're running a Java server and you're now the TLS endpoint, you can run Java either way, of course, right? And if you're a Java server, you, uh, what do you need at the server for stapling? Um, I, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's mostly client side code. I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I guess because the server itself will handle the stapling, I guess. Well, the server doesn't I mean, really handle. Yeah, I mean, you don't manage the certificate. Either. No, the server doesn't do stapling. It's just a certificate cat. It's just a. No, I mean, but the certificate is usually not managed by your uh, application if you're running it in a general. Your server needs to fetch the OCC response. So yeah. For less encrypt, for example, it's valid for four days. So your server needs to refresh it every four days, get a fresh one. Yep. And then um, attach it to, to the TLS handle, which assumes the information to be there. So, so, 
So let's review real quick. Exactly. Let, let, let's review real quick. There's two, two major needs for OCS. There's two major features that are supported, that need to be supported to have good OCSB stapling in Java. On the client side, you have to do your signature verification for the stapling message. On the server, you have to be going back to the OCSP, OCSB responder every X number of days to ensure that it's still a live cert so you can add the information to your actual TLS cert that you hand down to the client. So those are the two pieces that Java is going to need to support. Cool. And OCSP is actually quite delicate to see as well. That's why the security certificates are so short in lifetime. So uh, otherwise they uh, would have too much security certificates to generate OCSP for. So that's the limiting factor in their infrastructure for generating the CSP response. Thank you. Fantastic. I appreciate that that enhancement there, that uh, that Java enhancement. So let, let's shift gears to JEP 288 now, right? So this gives me an excuse. Before we get into JEP 288, this gives me an excuse to, to briefly summarize some of the benefits of TLS before we talk about it, right? So we get the three benefits of TLS, confidentiality, integrity, authenticity. We just mentioned that just a bit ago. We know what a TLS certificate is. The, the main feature of a TLS certificate that provides the authenticity, that provides this, this attestation, authenticity for the web, is because the signature of the CA's private key is gonna sign your server's public key, which is handed down to the browser or client. The client has the public keys of every authority baked into it, which verifies that signature. And if it's good, boom, the, uh, the client's usually happy with the TLS connection, even if it was done in a fraudulent fashion. As long as the client can verify the signature, it's usually happy. And even when attack, even when it, uh, when certain mechanisms man in the middle and provide fake keys, as long as that signature is valid, unless you're doing certificate pinning, clients usually don't care. This is, I think, a problem with TLS. It is easily interceptable, and it's de it's extremely debatable if this is good or not. Those who run companies and run large organizations and run governments, they love this capability. But those that are very privacy centric feel that this is a, a horrific thing. I, I, I don't have a clear answer, but this is a reality of what drives the world today. And there's one more quick note before I go too much further. Um, if you give me your machine and let me install my own authority into your machine, every, all of these advanced security checks around pinning, they all go away. We have attacks like the Skipfish issue from the Lovino, Lovino hardware. We have attacks, we have issues from Dell. Dell supports, it. but by the way, take a step back. Why did Skipfish uh, uh, man the middle of your TLS connections on Lovino machines last year? Superfish, right? So, I'm sorry, uh, su Superfish, my apologies, Superfish. Superfish, and this is the research from Robert Graham. So Superfish was an advertisement software package installed into Lo, I'm sorry? They just want to add ads to TLS connections. So, that, so, so Superfish would install their own private authority into your browser, essentially turning off TLS security, essentially turning off certificate pinning, letting, letting you know, the, the advertisement service man the middle, essentially even your pinned HTTPS connections. This is, this is insane. And it brought a lot of awareness to this problem as well. Just a quick side note. So keep an eye on your, keep, be careful about installing local authorities onto your machine. And when you have a work machine, just be aware, your employer is probably man the middling even your Gmail and banking connections because they can install authorities on your machine relatively easy. In, in your browser, you'll see two different kinds of authorities. There's an internet class authority. Then there's usually, they call it either a security device authority, which is just a locally installed authority which turns off all security of, of good TLS. This bothers me, and I, I don't have a good answer, but I digress. Yeah. Do you know what the worst part about the Superfix story? The password that protected the, the private key was in the package, and the password, it took Robert Graham about uh, like a half an hour to crack the password. So now Robert Graham's got the private key. He announced the password to the world, so it's not just the advertiser 
who can man the middle of every single Lono machine in that era. Now anyone in the world had that private key to man the middle of anyone with Lovano. This was like, bang. It brought radical awareness to the problem of TLS to the tech and security world. I'm glad it happened. We get, we now know. And if you try to talk to, and who's the main standard writer who, who made this happen? This is a Google guy, right? Ryan Sleevy, I think his name is, Slivy or something? I don't know his name exactly. Try talking to Ryan about this. I mean, a lot of people have tried to engage this conversation. It's, it's a solid issue. It's not something that's going to change. It's not something that's going away. This is part of how TLS works now. So any, any other thoughts on this? Yeah, it's, I just don't, I don't like it. But that's the way the world works. So JEP 288, it's the attempt, it's the first step towards disabling SHA-1 certificates. So the use of SHA-1 is a problem because of collisions. Theoretically, up until recently, it was a theory based on, that, that it was a theory that we could, if you give me a message with a SHA-1 signature, then I can find a collision to make my own signature to, uh, to, to get around that, that protection. And up until five days ago, this was a mathematical theory. So hang on now. So there's a big urgency to move on. We knew about this problem from a mathematical perspective for, for a couple decades now, or, or for a, not, a, not a couple decades, for a, a little bit over a decade now. 2005, cryptographers proved SHA-1 could be cracked 2,000 times faster than predicted. At one point in the recent past, 90% of all websites protected their site identity with SHA-1 in some way. The number now is, is, is very, very small. There's been enough work from things like SSL Labs and Google especially and Firefox to shut, to shut this down. So the, the issue is back in 2012, it cost me a couple million dollars worth of research in theory to do a forgery. Where now in 2016, it's going to cost under a million. And, in the, and in, as, as more laws continue, it's going to be incredibly inexpensive to do these collisions. So, but again, up until recently, this is just theory. This is mathematical theory. So, so even though browsers and, and other professionals wanted SHA-1 to go away as, as part of a signature chain, this is just mathematical theory. But Google didn't care. Google began making the move to shut down SHA-1. In Chrome version 39, this is back in 2014, if you have a cert that expires in January of 2017 using SHA-1 or mixed content, you'll get the yellow triangle of doom. In November 2014 with Chrome 40, if you have certs that expire between June of 2016 to December of 2016 using SHA-1 in the signature chain, you'll just get a, you, you'll get a, a blank document there showing it's not a, not a green lock like we've been trained to look at. And if it, as of Chrome 41, back in uh, quarter one, 2016, not too long ago, search that expire on or after January 2017 with SHA-1 in the chain will be flat out crossed out as being an insecure connection. So uh, this is subtle. It's not like end of the world for a website, but for some it is a big deal. There's also going to be an effect to your search engine ranking when you make these mistakes. But Google has been pushing hard to make this go away. There's a lot of, lot, of, lot of discussion on Google's blog on security about this over the years as well. According to Mozilla, these are the choices Mozilla is making, right? They show the untrusted connection error whenever a publicly issued SHA-1 cert is issued after, is issued after January of 2016. And they'll show untrusted connection error for all SHA-1 certs after January of 2017. More information about Firefox's position on this there. They're close to being in parity with Chrome. It, this is a great website. It's called SHA.com. This is a way for you to quickly check you, your or other domains to see if SHA is part of the signature in some way. Why they call it SHA with so many A's.com? What is this a nod to? This is a nod to an early Star Trek movie when Kirk would yell, Khan! Never mind, this is the one. <laughs> Does anybody here know about Khan and Star Trek? No. You're, we already know, you don't know Star Wars. You're, you're dead to me. I'm sorry, you don't exist. You know, you know, 
Anyone saw the original Star Trek movies? Oops. Oh my God. I maybe even have, but, but you hurt me. No. You hurt last, me. Last week it was announced that a, a collision would cost about a hundred thousand dollars for Shaw One. As of five days ago, yeah. Shaw One collisions are no longer theoretical. As of five days ago. Google just popped the brain of every cryptographer and security centric uh, 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 application security professional on the planet by releasing the first series of files with the SHA-1 collision. They've been working on this for several years with a, with a university in the Netherlands where they finally published two PDF files, different data with the exact same signatures by using their supercomputer cluster and research from, from different, different academics. and. They actually published these two files. So SHA-1 collisions are no longer theoretical. They are in the wild. And what happened is one of, one of the developers of WebKit took these two collision PDF files, made a unit test to detect it within, the, the, uh, with, within WebKit, and by checking in those two SHA-1 signed PDF files with different data but the same signature, he corrupted the whole SVN WebKit repository and shut it down. So they, they were nothing, there was no data loss. It's such a denial of service attack. But there's so much software out there that depends on SHA-1, including like Linux and Git, and that, that the, the, the impact of what, of what SHA becoming real, uh, what collisions be going from theory to reality, what the impact is is still being worked out. Because when Google released these two PDFs, they released weapons. These could be used to attack systems now. I don't think folks realize this. So this is a big deal. Yeah. Now, a, a quick aside. If, if crypto is important to you, please keep an eye on the Java cryptographic roadmap. I mean, this is well-maintained. It's last updated a couple days ago. Take a look at all the major crypto changes we've seen in Java. In Java 8, it's, the real, it's really the biggest enhancement to crypto we've seen in the history of Java. We see the NSA Suite B cryptography coming out. We see strong ephemeral cipher suites being pulled out to stop passive monitoring attacks. We finally see better support for high entropy random number support. I can now just say, use the secure random class and say, please just give me the strongest random number algorithm and it will just, it will do that for you. So some of, and, and uh, several weak algorithms are being shut down by default. Uh, there's actually a professional in the Java team called Dr. Depreciator, whose main job is to shut things down. So we saw a lot of big moves in Java 8 in a positive direction. But hang on for a second here. Please don't use Java crypto APIs for any reason. You as a developer, in, unless you're building crypto security libraries and you have like five PhDs in math, crypto, and discrete mathematics and other, you should not be touching these APIs. That goes for myself as well. What you should be doing is using something like Libsodium. Libsodium is written by, first of all, Dan Bernstein provided a series of C-level cryptographic libraries that are just some of the best on the planet right now using all the modern techniques we not. This is called NACL. Libsodium is, is written by Adam, I forgot his last name, but, and, and this is probably the best security crypto library in the Java ecosystem today. It's what you should be using. And it makes your work a lot easier. And it's not perfect, but the, the secure defaults are significant. Those who have reviewed it have, have given it a significant thumbs up in its capabilities. So it'll make your job easier and give you radical better security than trying to use the Java crypto API, primitive APIs on your own. I don't mean this in a disrespectful way. Any of us in the room, if we're gonna start, unless you are extremely deep into this topic, PhD level study, all of us will get it wrong. Doing crypto is tough. So let's, let's grab a library that's been well vetted. It's not trivial to use this, I, I may add. You have to install native APIs and stuff on your platform, but this is the best way to do real cryptography in the Java ecosystem today. And this is the direction you should go in, I dare say. Don't you, again, do not use Java crypto APIs yourself. You're probably gonna go down a path of failure. When, just as a quick aside, what if I go and, what if I open up Java and I call the default AES mode? If I just say, give me AES, what mode does Java 
default to. C. What's that? ECB, baby. Yeah. The reason I know this is because when we first pushed out AES, Jeff Williams, we first pushed out AES, we had a, we had a basic cryptographic storage API that used the default Java AES. Like we're security professionals pushing out a security library, giving you an interface to talk to ECB version of AES. Shame on us. Shame on us for doing that. You know what, real quick, what is, what is AES ECB? It's electronic code book mode, otherwise known as fucking plain text. Yes. That's basically what it is. It's illusion, it's not real security. It's meant to encrypt something for like a few, a fraction of a second. It's not meant to encrypt something long term. There's no good use for ECB, yet Java defaults to this. This is one of many problems with the language. So please, use a library that does it right for you. The other choice, and the library I like better, frankly, is called Google Keysar, but it's not being maintained any, any longer. Now, Google Keysar defaults to CBC with all the right integrity stamps and all that good stuff. It's still decent even today, but if, if I was doing a new project where crypto was critical, I'd definitely use Libsodium. Well, well done. Cool? So let's also talk about the future of Java. Any questions? But anything we've talked about so far? In the coding, do you have to, I mean, you can still specify the, the, the mode key, as you say. You know, it, it, default, it defaults to all the, you know, the thing is, you don't have to configure that stuff. You don't have to ask about mode. You do things like encrypt for me, please, and it does all that work for you. It's a very simple to use API. It's not, it's not like, you ever heard of JSIPT or JCrypt or whatever? This is just a low-level API. They, they sell themselves as a security library, but they're, they're really not. They're just another low-level API talking to, to Java's crypto API. And that, that doesn't help anyone. They make a lot of mistakes doing that. Now you have Google Keys are much better. You do things like encrypt a, a, a string object, and it does all the work for you. Libsodium is very similar. The whole point is you don't have to go and configure your all the things you must configure, the mode, the IV management, and, and the key, all that garbage goes away in the library. And it's, it's a well-vetted library as well. The downside to Libsodium is it's not a pure Java API. It is, it's native. So you have NACL, which is all the, 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 the JNI to C, C code, basically, that you have to install on each system. It's not that difficult, but when you have like, you know, 100 developers working on this, it becomes a little bit of a, challenge to get the dev environment set up for everyone and, and so on and so forth. Okay, let's shift to the web now. Moving towards a plug-in free web, right? What do you think about uh, Java's history with, uh, with web plugins and, and such? Great, isn't it? <laughs> for a, before Milton Smith ran the security team at Java, uh, at, at the Java team, th this was one of the the, the major ways attackers would go after systems in general. They would attack your JVM on the client. It had as many problems as we see from like Flash and other client side, you know, rich, rich client side technologies. They're all problematic. We want a plug in free web. That's the, that's the general direction the web is going in. We want these things native in the browser. We want plugins to go away from a security point of view. So in Java 9, the web plugin is going to be deprecated. It's not removed, but they're finally fully deprecating the Java 9 web plugin. So please note, the tech press ran with this way more than what was actually said. So please read those articles with a bit of caution. Whenever you see the press talking about Java, they rarely know what they're talking about. They, they confuse Java on the server with Java on the client and... You know, I, I can't keep up with how, how bad it is. So I, this is a quick, quick digression. So the plugin will be deprecated at 9, which means it will still be there for compatibility, but discouraged and scheduled for actual removal at a later time. Also, real stats showed a dramatic drop in Java plugin attacks before this was done. So you know since, because dur again, during the Milton Smith era, 2014-15, Oracle and Java went berserk in fixing as many of these problems as possible. They, they matured their SDLC. And even before this was shut down, all these horrific problems with Java on the client 
had already been mitigated to, to a large degree. They already been, not, not solved, but it's, it already gotten a lot better where Java on the client was no longer the number one whipping boy in attack vector. It was at least somewhere else down the list. So they had already gotten better at, at this time. And again, uh, just a, a kind of a neat, a, a neat fact. Stuart Marks, part of the JDK team, otherwise known as Dr. Depreciator, he's, he, his sole job is, is making some of these choices. So an interesting fellow to follow right, in, on, on the web. So here are a few Java security. Uh, here's a few Jeps for those who are into security tools, right? Of, all, of any language out there, I think that in terms of static analysis, these are tools to look at your code, fancy compilers basically, looking for security vulnerabilities. By far, the static analysis tools for Java are the most mature in the industry right now. You know, Java is the most popular language by a wide, uh, Java, let me take, take a step back. Ja is Java the most popular language? No, not in the web. What am I trying to say? In, in the enterprise, right? In the enterprise, not, on, not for public websites. That's PHP who rules that world. But for the enterprise, Java still to this day rules the enterprise. It's not even sexy anymore. It's just like, it's like the new C, right? It just runs everything these days. It's not perfect, but it's something we, we, we know. It's commoditized technology now. And so oh, I'm, I'm ashamed of this slide title. What does the slide title say? Making analy make analyzing Java for security great again. Ha, ha, ha. Very funny. That was a lot funnier before that effort got elected president, right? <laughs> All right. So it's the moment of silence for the whole world. All right. So a, a variety of JEPs in Java 9 are going to help security tool vendors analyze Java for security in more effective ways. We got the uh, we have JEP 236, which is Nashorn. What's Nashorn? This is basically a full ECMAScript compliant compiler and abstract syntax tree inside of Java. So now I can do things like I can grab your JavaScript, put it into a, a compiler model and analyze it for security problems in Java. Thank you. JavaScript is one of the most difficult languages to analyze from a security point of view. So was, JavaScript was written by a completely insane madman, right? Crockford, right? So, and it's, it's wide open language that you can literally do you can literally do the same thing in hundreds of different ways in JavaScript. And again, it's one of the most difficult languages to analyze from a security point of view through automation. So we have we have uh, you know Nashorn. <coughs> Let me just read this. Jet two thirty six. This is part of the scripting language stuff from when JavaScript engine Rhino made its way into Java six. This is actually all in the open JDK Da Vinci machine of how different languages run the JVM. These ASTs, an AST is an abstract syntax tree. That's just like a data model of your language as part of the compiling process. So usually what, what a static analysis engine does is it takes your language, it does a pre-compile step and converts it to an abstract syntax tree, which is a data, which is a, uh, uh, a data structure that you can then parse with a rule system looking for security security vulnerabilities. This is how static analysis tools like Fortify and IBM AppScad Source Edition and, and other, other tools in the market analyze Java. Anyone can move to an abstract syntax tree, but how you traverse that tree and what rules you use is what differentiates these tools in the market. <coughs> One advantage of Nashorn is that it allows for quick prototyping of functionality or basic shell scripts that use Java libraries. We have that. We have more mature analysis capability in Java 9. JEP 1190. This is a framework in conjunction with the type annotations provided by JSR 308. That's JEP 104. This will allow users to define extensions that can perform arbitrary static analysis at compile time. Why is this such a big deal? Let me say this one more time. JEP 190 is going to let individual teams define static analysis extensions that they can add to, add to Java at compile time. Someone tell me why this is such a big deal. Why is this a big deal? When do we normally do security checks on Java code 
in, in, in the SDLC. How does that usually work? What's that? Reading talk process gets made or reading pull requests. Just yeah. human beings reading reading the, the job. Even if I gave you like Fortify, when do people usually use that? Well, all I'm trying to say is this. I write the code, I get it on my dev server, test it a bit, then I'm about to push it live and I'll run Fortify or similar tool through it or look for security vulnerabilities and try to go fix a few of those. It's usually late in the life cycle where we run these tools looking for security bugs. So now I can, and also these tools miss things like access control vulnerabilities, business logic vulnerabilities. These tools don't handle that unless you make custom rules, which is expensive and time consuming. And they, and they usually are not run until late in the cycle. Now, if you want to, you, there's a framework available where you can start adding both static analysis rules, custom static analysis rules to your code base, enhance the compiler, roll this out to your team. So just like normal warning flags in Java, you can now build these custom static analysis rules for things that tools do poorly and, and have it happen as developers are doing their work and compiling code. This is a big opportunity to do security checking much earlier in the software lifecycle. So I'm, I'm personally very excited about this. We also see JEP 243. It allows for three major things. Again, this is we finally have deep access into the JVM for the first time as Java 9 comes out. Number one, we can access, this is again, JEP 243. We can access virtual machine data structures required by an optimized, I'm sorry, we can access the JVM data structures required by an optimizing bytecode to machine code compiler like classes, fields, methods, profiling information, and similar. Two, installing compiled code along with all metadata required by the JVM for managing compiled code such as GC maps and information support de-optimization is all being exposed now. Three, plugging into the JVM's compilation system to handle servicing JVM requests to produce machine codes for method. Now, until now, all of this was just not possible in a reasonable way. You had to fork the freaking JDK or JVM to pull this off, and people did. It's open source, but now it's built into the language. So from an average developer and team point of view, this is all no big deal. But to those who are building next generation security analysis tools, this, these are dramatic positive changes for Java. So I really hope the whole next generation of static analysis tools for Java take advantage of these features. They, they, they really have to. They present it as a, as a performance optimization, right? I'm sorry? If I'm reading the JEP, I read, I'm reading the JEP with, uh, uh, along with you. <laughs> that's what the JEP says. The JEP says it's, it's for performance. Because now I can do deep JVM level performance tuning. I don't care about that though. I'm looking at it in a whole different way. Now, if I'm building a static analysis tool, I can like do runtime profiling of, of I, I can now put hooks into the JVM to do security analysis and more. This, this is better than, prof this is a very big deal, I think, yes. for, for yeah, security I, I do, tools. I, I do agree, yes. It gives you the hooks, all the safe points, all the de-optimization de points where you can, uh, normally the debugger is uses that to inspect the code, runtime. And when you when you set a breakpoint somewhere in your code, and it's highly optimized usually, exactly. just to deoptimize that. And now you get an interface to actually be there at the moment that the compilation happens. And what we had before was the profiling API, which we can turn on, which is which is not that not that deep, and also had has major performance problems when I want to run it in in, in production, which we, we don't want to do. So this isn't even this is like taking the uh, this taking the profiling API, which gave us you know X amount of data, and basically exposing the whole JVM to us, it's a, yes. it's a it is a dramatic dramatic change. Yeah. It's not too late to go to Bart's talk. All right, <laughs> let's talk about Java modularity, and this is this is the final major topic here, right? So. JDK 9's big feature is going to be modularity. It's called Jigsaw. This is why Java 9 is being delayed. They go back a few steps beyond what was done in Java 8 with compact profiles, where modularity is actually a security benefit because there's less. Hey, by the way, anybody using Coraba? Using Coraba? Anyone? You're using Coraba. Not yet. 
not anymore, but the, the yeah, previous, no, yeah. the previous <laughs> project uses it, and not and, and better than that, it uses the uh, such an old version to integrate with all the uh, old uh, uh, stuff. Let, 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 let's stop for just a second. As I told my wife many times, I have absolutely no need for the truth or reality. I really prefer my personal world of fantasy and illusion. And I do not want to hear that you're using Corba in any way. So please, just lie to me and say, I've never used it. I haven't touched it in years. And it's a bad technology, so I'm just, I don't even think about it. So please, lie to me. Okay. Who here is using Corba? Good. Thank you. Let's move on. So if you don't want Corba, then get rid of it. You don't want people using some secret internal crypto API or whatever you're making? Don't expose it. If you're an admin whose application re uh, really, really needs to violate this, okay, you can break modularity, but you need to do it yourself on your own system. JLink, this is JEP282, is going to go well beyond the server JRE. So let's, let, let's, let's get into this. Why do we want to reduce the JRE attack surface, right? There's... This is just a good thing, right? Right now, yeah, we, we, we want to remove things we're not using for, for, for a lot of reasons. So first of all, let's take a step back. Go back to 2013. We already had the ability to do, to do first generation modularity in Java by running your JVM in client or server mode, right? So if you're running a server application, you run it with a server flag, and all the garbage applet classes that you don't run in the server, imaging API, all the garbage, applet API is garbage, layout managers are garbage, don't even get me started. Moment of, let's take a moment for layout managers. We could already turn all that stuff off in 2013. <coughs> and, and that was a radical reduction of the, of the attack surface already. <coughs> Excuse me. And so... Now in Java 8, we got the first step towards mature modularity. We got Comprac profiles. So the regular JRE is about 163 megabytes of, of code. Compact 3, I can remove graphics, Corba, and sound. There's 21 megabytes going away. Compact 2, I can turn off Kerberos and JMX monitoring. There's 15 megabytes away. Compact 1, no JDBC or XML. There's 11 meg XML parsing. There's 11 megabytes gone away. So we had limited modularity in the, in the Java 8 world. But as we move into Java 9, where we have real modularity jigsaw, JEP, JEP 200, we have a, uh, multiple benefits happening here. Here's the main benefit of what we get from jigsaw. Reliable configuration. Class path mechanism is going away. The whole, uh, so this is the problem, because how much, how many people in the room have spent more than 100 hours of their life tweaking with Java class path problems? Easy. Everyone, boom, that was like, lightning hands went up. So I, I, I want that part of my life back. I mean, literally, hundred. I've been a Java developer for about 20 years now. I am old and gray. And uh, I, I literally hundreds of hours of just, tweaking with class path settings, screaming most of the time too. I actually remember uh, when I was working on a project with MySpace, I, I was like four hours into trying to fix some class path issues that were on my plate and I, I just couldn't handle it. I'm Sicilian, we're not known to be gentle people. I remember I took my laptop and I threw it across the room at the wall over the head of the developer of my of the guy I was working with. He's a friend of mine, August. We grew up together as kids. So he ducked. It shattered against the wall. I dove at the laptop and started smacking it against, you know, smacking it against the table until it was, he, my, my friend sitting there looking at me like, like really, for the first time, like really frightened. Like, are, are you okay, Jim? I'm like, I'm actually feeling real good right now. I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> I feel much better. He's like, did you fix that class path problem? I'm like, it's all taken care of. No problem. <laughs> Some, you seem to walk away. You seem to walk away a little bit. That's a real funny story for me and only for me. Let's just move on. We also have strong encapsulation. So now we, it allows different components to declare which of its public types are accessible to other components. We have level of like code level access control to some degree. It will dramatically reduce program size when you're packaging up a full client side app. It reduces the attack service by letting you in an extremely granular way 
turn off pieces of the of the of the JVM. There are at least going to be 72 epic levels of modularity available in Java 9. This is remember back from the 2013 era, we had server and client. We had two levels of modularity. Then we then we go back to the uh, um, <coughs> the Java 8 era. I don't remember it, the compact profiles dozen or so levels of modularity. Now they're really breaking it down into pieces. We have 72 plus levels of modularity as, as Jigsaw goes live. And guess how complex this is to break things up like this. Java is so interwoven in terms of what uses what that this is causing a major delay. It's requiring a lot of re-engineering of the entire language to, to pull this off. So I, I'm, I'm okay to wait for that delay. The benefits here will be dramatic. Um, we, have time, yeah, we have time for this. Annotations, this is something we've had for a while. It's, it's a Java 8 enhancement. Th this gives us the checker framework and type annotations. Um, this lets us do a, a, a kind of taint tracking in Java. Let me show you what I mean. Like I can now do stuff like and say, look, here's my, here's my data, uh, uh, get parameter. And let, let me read this. This little chunk of code makes it clear that the, that the uh, return value string is going to be modifiable by a user. So when I say final string return value from this parameter, I flag it as tainted. Now, it doesn't get it automatically, right? This is not like it's, it's aware. You have to specifically say that request get parameter is going to be tainted. As a tainted or untrusted value is one that comes from an arbitrary, possibly malicious source like user input or, unval or, un or unvalidated data, in certain parts of your application, using a tainted value can compromise the app's integrity. This is what, how SQL injection, XSS, and every major uh, injection attack is, 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 is done. If the tainting checker issues no warning for a given program, then no tainted value ever flows to a sensitive sink. However, your program is not necessarily free from trust errors. The whole idea is... I flag a certain value as, as tainted. I flag certain endpoints as being sensitive sinks. And, I, and now it's built into my compiler. Whereas I compile my code, if any developer takes a tainted variable and pushes it to a sensitive sink, I'll get compiler warnings that let me, that let me handle this super early. You see the trend here of, of the least things that interest me? Rather than having a tool that lets me check my code down the SDLC, there's all these enhancements that let me do work to put it into my compiler and language at compile time, which I can roll out to my development team and catch these problems radically earlier in the SDLC. This isn't out yet. It's not like it's in mass use yet. These are relatively... Now, this has been around for a while, but but and, and, uh, as we as we... Provide this with the new enhancements to 9 as well. Now we have the real engine to do next generation static analysis tools. This is why this, this excites me. Again, I can flag certain endpoints as tainted. I flag certain endpoints as, <coughs> as being sensitive sinks. And now I can catch these problems at compile time without needing third-party tools. So what do we have here? I'm not sure if that's uh, I'm sorry? I'm not sure if that's uh, just... there's, there's a series. Take a look. Here's the link right here. Java platform group entry, Java 8S new type. You'll get all the explanation there. But there are several different kinds of flags that you can add to, to data. It's not just tainted. There's, there's a few other things going on here. Um, The only thing I know of and I've used myself is I know I, I can flag certain certain data types as tainted and I can and I can flag certain certain function uh, function parameters as as requiring untainted variables. That's all I know of right now. It is a fantastic first start. And we had this back from Java 2, I believe. It's a it's a it's an academic project that you could actually shoehorn into very old language, old versions of Java. But when we, when we have all the new JD, JVM enhancements for introspection of JVM combined with this, that's where it all, that's where the power, I think, is going to be 
uh, most extreme. The other, other annotations are non-null. Yeah, I can do this. I can say tainted. I can say non-null. I can say read only. So there are a couple other annotations beyond just tainted. There definitely are. <coughs> Mentioned this already. Yes. Yeah. Here I flag it as being tainted. Here I flag it as requiring it to be untainted. And you'll, get, you'll, you'll stop this at compile time from moving forward. So last note. You know, Andy Warhol said, you need to let the little things that would ordinarily bore you suddenly thrill you. In, in, in the United States, one of our economists, Greenspan, he talked about an idea called, uh, I, forget, I keep forgetting the word, enthusiasm for no reason. Uh, he talked about, uh, when our economy was soaring, he talked about um, unchecked enthusiasm or enthusiasm for no reason. I forgot the exact phrase. But that's what I'm asking for here a bit. It's like, let these little things thrill you. Be excited about these things happening. So here, here's why I'm, here's what I'm really trying to say. When you, much of the real work that has a very big impact in enhancing Java, it, it's, it seems like it's really boring. But take a look at the work of Joe Darcy. He cleaned up, as we work towards Java 9, he cleaned up literally thousands of bad lint warnings in the JDK. This is done by suppressed warnings or actually fixing the code. This is a dramatic and deep effort that took a huge, num a huge amount of work that doesn't get a lot of visibility usually. No one cares that a few lit warnings have been fixed. But, and again, I call this, this Greenspan called this irrational exuberance, which kind of like something that's near and dear to my heart, right? When you spend time to remove the things that aren't worth looking at, it's easier to see the things that are important. So the work that Joe did to just do lots of cleanup in the JVM, it gets all the noise out of the way so future enhancements to Java are going to be easier to identify. So if you have an idea as small as you may think it is, it helps clean the cruft up so we can see the really important things in a better way. So regardless of how small or how big your JEP is, I encourage you, from, from a selfish to a, to, a, you know, to a kind point of view, get involved. It's gonna, it, this is how we really push security of these languages down the field. And so I'm POW in, in Hawaii, and that means I'm done. I want to say thank you to Sean Mullen, who's the lead architect of Oracle's Java security team. And he's very kind to help this presentation. He's a lead of OpenJDK security group as well. And uh, so what can you do? Create some JEPs support existing JEPs, please play with J JDK 9 early access build as, as, as much as you can. Um, check out the quality outreach campaign, which helped open source groups handle feedback as well as Java. Um, I'm gonna say thank you. I'm, I'm gonna move that, a hooey ho, uh, until we meet again, right? See you later. Thank you for hanging out. I wish you went to Bart's talk instead of mine, but I appreciate you hanging out. Any questions before we wrap it up? Again, none of this is new or interesting. This is all stuff that's been published by Sun, or published by Oracle, and published by the Java team. Things that, that interest me from a security point of view. And uh, you know, go forth and write secure code. Thank you very much, everyone.